Welcome to Purposeful Empathy, a show dedicated to spreading more empathy throughout the world. Today's episode is brought to you by Grant Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy the show. So welcome to another episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by Jim Wharton, who is the Director of Conservation Engagement and Learning at the Seattle Aquarium. Now, the Seattle Aquarium is a conservation organization whose mission is inspiring conservation of our marine environment. And empathy, as it turns out, has become a key driver and strategy in this work, connecting people and animals and ecosystems and encouraging them to see the ocean as a source of hope, wonder and belonging, not to mention essential to survival. The Aquarium has shared effective practices and strategies for fostering empathy through publications and workshops with over 60 museums, zoos, and aquariums with a combined attendance of more than 70 million annually. So welcome to the show, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to have you. Um, Now, you believe empathy is a skill that we can all cultivate. How are zoos and aquariums flexing their empathy muscles to support conservation? Yeah, thanks. The, I think that uh, when we started this work, I was with, I was where a lot of people were in that uh, I felt like empathy was something that people were either born with or not, like you were either born an empathetic person or not. But when we started to dive into the research and learn that empathy was really more of a skill that people can cultivate, really that we're really encouraged by that. We think it feel like it really opens it up to everybody. And if it, if it's a skill that you can practice, then you need somewhere to practice. And so I think that zoos and aquariums and museums are fantastic places to, to practice and build those empathy skills. And empathy is particularly important to conservation because I, I think a lot of the issue with conservation uh, is that just people are very disconnected uh, with na- from nature. So they don't know where their food comes from. They don't know where their waste goes. Uh, they just, the animals and nature and natural spaces are, are often out of sight and out of mind in our increasingly urbanized society. So what better place than zoos and aquariums where people can come together and reestablish that connection. And empathy is really about connection. It's about understanding perspective and trying to learn the, and appreciate and feel and, and share the perspective of others. And those others can include and should include animals. And so, yeah, when we're, when you're thinking about zoos and aquariums as a place where people can practice empathy, it's great because it's a place where animals and people come together. Uh, and zoos are, are learning how to think about and present and talk about animals differently and in ways that encourage people to be able to take the perspective of animals a little more effectively. And, you know, one of the things that they're doing that is using things like pronouns when you're talking about an animal. So often we'll, when we refer to animal, we may say it, it is a very objectifying uh, kind of pronoun, but if you use he or she, it helps see the animal as a subjective other. Uh, it helps them see, and, and especially if you can use an animal's name, naming animals is something that zoos and aquariums have always had sort of a, um, you know, sketchy relationship with, you know, some animals get names and, and some animals even get named by donors and that sort of thing. But uh, other animals, like, it's almost like they don't deserve names, or, but you might not name a fish or you might not name a uh, sea anemone. So, but using that name, when you give an animal a name, you automatically give it a narrative. It, it's not a puffin, it's George the puffin. And George has uh, parents and George came from somewhere and George likes this kind of fish, but doesn't like that kind of fish. And so when people can start to see animals as that subjective other, they can see their similarities a little bit more easily. They can see what they have in common more easily and they can start to build that kind of uh, connection and rapport with animals. So does that mean as you're walking by, uh, at the tank, you've got the names of fish um, so that people are starting to make that connection. Is that happening? I, I think in some cases, uh, zoos and crams are more comfortable using names. A lot of them are not naming fish per se. Um, okay. So we're, we're working towards that. But the um, like a great example is, I believe it's at San Diego Zoo Global. They have the names of each of their cheetahs. Uh, right on the exhibit signage. So instead of just exhibit signage that says cheetah with the scientific species name and where it's from and its range and what it eats and and how endangered it may or may not be, they also have the animal's individual names and then a little paragraph on their personalities. Mm. And so that's 
that's a different way of looking at an animal. It's less about it as a museum specimen, right? Or a, a thing that you come to gawk at and more about this, this other being that you're, you're learning more about. Right. And in your opinion, why do you think animals and plants and ecosystems actually deserve empathy? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's, it's sort of easy to say that everything uh, uh, deserves empathy, but I think um, animals all deserve empathy because they need it. Um, because without it, it's easy for us to objectify and, and think about them as a resource, as opposed to something that's that's worth saving. So I, I think that empathy is important. And I think that often people feel like when they think about empathy, they think about emotions. And when they think about those emotions, they don't necessarily associate emotions with animals all the time. Mammals have most of the same uh, emotions, all of us across all mammals. But when you're thinking about something like a sea star or a sea anemone, often people are like, well, it doesn't have animals. I can't really have empathy. It doesn't have, excuse me, it doesn't have emotions. So I can't really have empathy for it. But when we think about empathy, especially our definition that we use, we think about it as sharing the perspective of an animal. And so an example I'll give you is when I was an educator at the Oregon Coast Aquarium, we had a collection of animals in our classroom and uh, they included sea stars. And so when the students came to the aquarium, we would take the stars out of the exhibit, put them in a small tub so that the kids could examine them very carefully up close. Well, a sea star is an interesting animal. And when, when you know, most people are sort of familiar with what a, a sea star or a starfish is, it's got those suction cups on the bottom that it uses to hold on. What they also have is at the tips of each one of their of their arms, they have little eye spots and those eye spots sense light and dark. And so those shadows that they could detect are often predators. And so when it comes time to take a sea star out of an exhibit and put it into a small tub, if I could get my hand on the sea star before it detected the shadow, it would come off very easily. But if it saw the shadow of my hand, it would clamp down and then I'd have to just leave it. Now, I'm not suggesting necessarily that the sea star was afraid of my hand, but it has a stimulus and response and a perspective of the world that we can appreciate. The analog for us might be fear. It's not really fear for a sea star, but you can appreciate that a sea, what a sea star is doing and why it's doing it. And so I think even with the simplest animals, uh, you can understand that they have a, an experience of the world and you can appreciate that experience. And I think that's where the foundation of empathy uh, sits for all living things, really. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier that all mammals have sort of a sense of emotions. I remember reading a book a long time ago, Why Elephants Weep, and learning that elephants have a really um, profound process of mourning the loss of somebody from, I guess, the, the clan. I don't know if that's the technical term for a group of elephants, but um, and, and pet owners have been saying that forever. Like my dog understands mm -hmm. me. I remember my cat Fluffy would come seek me out when I was crying as a teenager, right? So right. you're saying scientifically that mammals can actually have feelings across the entire spectrum of mammals. Is that is that true? So yeah, mammals have very similar emotions to, to people do, which shouldn't be surprising because we're all mammals. And um, I, I think it's, it's interesting, Carl Safina, who is a, a scientist and author, writes a lot about animal cognition. Uh, his perspective is that we would be better off assuming that animals are similar to us uh, and then learning in the ways that they're different rather than assuming that animals are different than us and learning about the ways that they're similar. And so there's a, there's a kind of... Um, anthrocentrism about that, right? Putting the person in the center, a kind of human exceptionalism that we're different and we're special. And sometimes when we learn that animals are very, very similar to us, for some people that almost makes it feel like we're less special. To me, that, mm -hmm. that makes me feel more special that I'm, that I'm like a sea star or that I'm like a shark. I think that's pretty cool. But I think that there's a, we're sort of our, our culturally, especially in Western cultures, we're, we're, we're particularly um, programmed to, to think of humans as different and better and more special and more capable than, than animals. Mm, yes, indeed. Now, why do you think some animals are easier to empathize with than others? Yeah, when we looked at the uh, literature again, we found that there, there are four characteristics that animals have that they present that seem to engender empathy in people very easily. And, and so one of those is agency. So when a person can see an animal doing something to meet its needs, so it's eating or it's playing or it's grooming, 
they can see themselves in that animal, right? So that animal does things to survive. I do things to survive. I, I understand that you can feel that connection. Another one of those characteristics is affectivity. And in people that would be like facial expressions or body language. For some animals, we, we recognize affectivity. So like in our pets, especially, so dogs and cats, we see wagging tails, we see an arched back the cat and we feel like we understand that what those those cues mean so that affectivity is there for a lot of animals people just mistake activity for affectivity so a really active animal is happy a really uh, sedentary animal is sad so when they sometimes when people see like big cats sleeping all the time at a zoo they're like oh that cat looks so depressed but it's really just because it spends 20 hours a day sleeping just like it would in the wild um, another characteristics is uh continuity. So the amount of time that we spend with an animal, another reason why we feel like we know our, our pets so well, because we, we spend so much time with them, we get to understand their sort of body language cues, the things, their behaviors, and we, we begin to believe that we understand them a little bit better. So it's easier for us to empathize with them. And then that fourth characteristic is coherence. And, and so let me just, let me share an image with you. So Coherence just means that an animal looks like an animal. So it has uh, eyes and a mouth, it has an arms and a legs. Uh, and so when you look at the, the sea otter there, the little fuzzy one on, on my left, uh, it looks like an animal. Even if you've never seen a sea otter before, you're presented with a sea otter, you're like, that's an animal, it's super cute, I'm in love with it. Um, but the animal on the right is a sea anemone. And a sea anemone looks as much like a flower as it looks like an animal. Uh, but it has some of the same characteristics in the, in the center of these, this ring of tentacles here is a mouth. Uh, that mouth does the same thing that the sea otter's mouth does, actually does a few extra things. Uh, but once a person can see or understand how an animal is put together, it helps them uh, be, feel more connected to it. So that, that coherence, it's a really big one. So when an animal has eyes, people really, it's very easy for people to empathize. Now, the cool thing about the char these characteristics is that you can recognize that some animals like sea otters have them, you know, like crazy, right? Uh, it's, it's doing things all the time, like grooming and feeding and playing. Uh, it's got this incredible coherence. It obviously looks like an animal. It's very expressive and it moves around a ton. Uh, so it's very, there's got a lot of affectivity. And then people are pretty familiar with, with sea otters. They've seen them on TV or they've visited them at zoos and aquariums or they've been around other animals that were very similar to them. So uh, otters often remind us of our dogs or our cats. So people feel like they have a lot of continuity. With another animal, like say a barnacle, you, you can use the characteristics that I've just talked about, even though they're not obvious in something like a barnacle. And let me see if I can, I'm not, I may not have a, a picture of a barnacle handy, but the, um, when you think about what a barnacle looks like in a barnacle, those animals that live on the, live on the rocks on the, in the tide pools, uh, they look like a little, little white volcano and people mistake them for rocks. But when you, when you, there's a moment sort of that barnacles have that people get, uh, go from sort of barnacle apathetic to barnacle mildly interested. Uh, and that's when they start to see them feed. And what happens when a barnacle feeds is you see these little things that come out of the, of the shell and they look like, like eyelashes or feelers or something like that. And in that moment, if you can help a person understand that the barnacle is feeding, it's gathering little tiny microscopic plants and animals out of the water to feed, then suddenly it's an animal with agency. Uh, and then when you further help them understand that what they're seeing are not eyelashes or feelers, but in fact, the legs of the animal and that a barnacle looks like a shrimp that's sort of glued to the rock by its head with a little shell around it, then people can see some of the coherence of that animal. Uh, and then, you know, once they see that affectivity, that activity that helps them understand, again, that it's an animal and connected, it's alive, like I'm alive. And then, you know, the, that sort of continuity clock starts when they see an art barnacle the next time, they have a really different relationship with it. They understand that it's a living thing. They may not step on it in a tide pool. They may uh, tell a friend about it. They may seek it out at an aquarium. And so you can use these characteristics very strategically to help people build more empathy for animals, no matter, no matter what they may look like. Um, is it okay to anthropomorph? Okay, let me, I've been practicing, but I got it wrong. So there's this word, anthropomorphize is it okay to yep. anthropomorphize animals and just for because i looked it up just to be sure yeah 
is to attribute human characteristics or behavior to a god, animal, or object. So is it okay to do yeah. that with animals? So it's we do it all the time, right? It's just natural. We anthropomorphize everything. So um, we give our car a name and we call it she or and you know we do it. We're doing it constantly. Uh, anthropomorphize is it's just something that we do to help feel that connection. So we see something that we admire and, and we attribute human characteristics to it because, like I said before, because we have this human exceptionalism. When we attribute human characteristics to something, it's a it's the ultimate compliment, isn't it? Um, zoos and aquariums have always been very squeamish about anthropomorphism because we feel like it, it's, um, perhaps it's not scientific. It's not understanding the animal as it really is. And, but again, I think that that's, that's rooted in some of that human exceptionalism. And in the end, anthropomorphism is a metaphor, right? It's a metaphor and metaphors help us with our understanding. So you think about that sea star example again, is it, it's not, I'm not anthropomorphizing by talking to a young group of kids and saying that the sea star might be afraid of my hand, but I'm helping them understand the sea star's experience of the world in terms that they understand. And so when we anthropomorphize them, a lot of that is just us reaching out to understand an animal. The, the, the problem comes is when we, when we anthropomorphize or empathize for that matter without understanding the animal. And so I think one of the things that we're careful about when we're working with other zoos and aquariums is that not to suggest that empathy is better or a substitute for the kind of knowledge base learning that we've been doing at zoos and aquariums forever. We need to know the stuff about animals. Often it's what we default to almost to our detriment. Um, for example, an otter is a great example. Otters will sometimes, uh, when they're out in the ocean, they live in a very turbulent uh spot in the ocean. They live in these big rafts of otters. And sometimes the otters will sort of hold hands when they're sleeping so that they don't drift apart so that the, so that the rafts stay together. When people see that, they, it looks like holding hands, like people hold hands and they think, oh, they love each other, right? They, they just, it's, it just melts their hearts. And sometimes when uh, our staff or volunteers may use the dreaded A word, uh, which is Actually, uh, it's just a biological behavior that helps them, you know, keep from drifting away in the, in the turbulent oceans. That A word is, we're trying to train that out of all of our staff because it always, you know, it never makes you feel good. But the, um, what we're trying to encourage people to do is, how, is, to, is to be able to deliver that information and, and supplement it and allow people to have this emotional connection because often we have a little science policeman that lives on our shoulder that just wants to stamp the, the, the emotional connections out of absolutely everything that we do. So there is an opportunity, for example, at the Seattle Aquarium, we have several generations of otters. So we have, uh, we have a grandma and we have mom and we have a pups. And so they definitely have some kind of a relationship there's another, there's an opportunity to use a different A word also. Did you also know that this behavior allows them to stay connected in a turbulent ocean? So I think when we anthropomorphize, there's a purpose behind it. It's, it's a person that's reaching out to understand an animal. And as long as we're doing it in the context of that animal's life and its natural history, then I think it could be very productive. Um, another great example is that we have giant Pacific octopuses at the Seattle Aquarium. Uh, it's a very big animal and the large, at, at it, so I mean, the ones that we have, they can be 60, 70 pounds. Um, they can be three, four or five feet across from, you know, tip to tip of their arms. So very big animal. Uh, and it lives in, a, in what I think is a palatial uh, octopus exhibit. But sometimes people might see that animal. And if they don't understand anything about an octopus, they might see an octopus alone in an exhibit and think, well, that octopus is all by itself. It must be lonely be lonely if I were alone in that exhibit. Uh, and it's not moving around much, so it's probably depressed. I don't move around much when I'm sad. Uh, and this exhibit seems kind of small. It's a big animal. I, I feel like it should be in a bigger exhibit. But if you understand that it's A, it's a solitary animal. And if we put another octopus in there, they might attack or try to eat each other. Uh, you wouldn't feel so bad about it being by itself. If you knew that it is a nocturnal species, so active at night, you might realize that it's wouldn't really expect it to be that active during the day. If aliens came down from space and and you know sort of studied people only at night, might be, might not be very impressed with us. And there's also great research that that shows us that that kids use anthropomorphism from an early age to help create a connection to nature. 
And I think that we've always, especially in, in West culture, we're very, we're very comfortable with kids having a more magical view of the world when they're young and then growing out of that as they get older, because getting a more sophisticated view of the world. Well, first, I want to say thank you for all of that, but also for, ex- you didn't maybe notice that you were doing it, but you've given me the plural to octopus. So I didn't know they were octopuses. <laughs> I think a lot of people might think they're octopi or something. Uh, and I might have fallen into yeah. that category. Um, but I also want to just ask before, before I get to a final question about this amazing children's book um, that you that you've collaborated on, you know there was I, I grew up in the '70s as a kid, right? And we went to zoos mm-hmm. and aquariums, and and then I felt like growing up, at least in I don't know the last ten or twenty years, that there was something about zoos and aquariums being a bit passe because these animals were stuck you know, as, a, you know, we were objectifying them and they were not always treated very well. And, and, and it seems to me like the way you're talking about your animals, your creatures at your aquarium is that there's a deep reverence and the idea is to bring that reverence mm. to the wider public. So has there been like a sweeping movement across aquariums and zoos? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking that because th- there was that TV show, <laughs> about the tiger king you know and and the whole idea of you know how to treat oh, yeah. creatures that are caged could you speak to that discourse a bit yep sure yeah uh, zoos and aquariums 100 percent absolutely evolved over time right the, the original zoos and aquariums were uh just menageries for royalty right they, they were and, and then they became places where people could come and gawk at the at the the strangeness of nature uh, zoos and aquariums then evolved into being places of learning. So it's a place where you go to learn about, but even in learning, sometimes there's an objectification, right? There's a thing that we're learning about. Uh, zoos and aquariums have since emer- sort of evolved into conservation organizations. And so the best zoos and aquariums, the ones that I have the most respect for, uh, the only reason they exist is to help uh, create conservation outcomes. So to make sure that these animals have a place in the wild and that people, because ultimately, conservation is not really about animals or habitats. It's about people. People are both the problem and the solution. If you take people out of the equation, everything, nature fixes itself. Um, but we're not going to do that. So we need to learn how to, to live in, in sort of harmony with nature. So zoos and aquariums have moved to uh, less about the, the sort of cage and single species exhibits and sort of the things that you may have grown up with that I, I grew up with. Uh, and we've moved to multi-species exhibits, to ecosystem and habitat themed exhibits. We've focused on um, exhibits that are about a sense of place so that you understand that animal in the context of its habitat, and especially in the context of the habitat that's immediately around the zoo or particularly endangered habitats around the world. And so, yeah, I think that zoos and aquariums have become uh, a much more uh, complex sort of um, undertaking for sure. Uh, we've certainly evolved. There's nobody who cares about those animals more than the people that care for them at a zoo or aquarium. And I think that we we do hold not only a sense of reverence for those animals, but a deep responsibility to them. So if we are going to, to have those animals in our care, it better be for something important. And for us, uh, that's conservation. Now that said, not all uh, animal care facilities are created equal. Um, So there is the uh, Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which is our professional organization, uh, which has a very strict accreditation process. Uh, So we go through it every five years. We put in an application that could be two, 300 pages long. We have a group of people that come out and do a week long white glove inspection that's focused on animal care and welfare and safety. And so institutions that have... um, that achieve that accreditation standard. And there's about 232 around the United States and the rest of the world. Uh, you, can, you can feel confident that those animals are well cared for, that the, the outcomes, the purpose of that organization is to create conservation outcomes. And then there are places like you, you saw in the Tiger King. You know, there are, those are places where animals are being exploited. Uh, those are places that do not deserve our patronage. Um, and so, I think when people think of zoos and aquariums, and if, if what they have in mind is the Tiger King, I don't blame them for feeling feeling uh, you know not so great about them. But uh, I would prefer I would I would prefer them to think about places like the Seattle Aquarium, uh, places like Shedd Aquarium and Monterey Aquarium, San Diego Zoo Global, um, my home zoo when I was growing up, the Detroit Zoo. So 
there are these accredited zoos and aquariums are just amazing places and they're doing incredible work not only in their facilities but all over the world so we're we're doing some conservation work now in the coral triangle um there are a host of of aza facilities that are doing work in um, africa asia just about every continent on earth um so I think the, the new mission of zoos and aquariums, their purpose as conservation organizations, it's certainly different uh, than when we were growing up. And, um, and I think I, I'm certainly proud to work at, a, at, a, at an aquarium. And um, you know, I think that uh, if people feel a little nervous about zoos and aquariums, I think they should, they should give them another look. Yeah, I'm so glad I asked that question, but now we can get into this book. I'm so excited to talk about this. So the Seattle Aquarium recently collaborated on a children's book uh, called Catastrophe by the Sea. I looked it up on Amazon. And when we get back to Canada, I'm going to order it for my daughter. She's turning five. So I think it's just the right age. Oh, perfect. Which yeah. encourages readers to empathize less with less traditionally charismatic animals. So could you just tell us a little bit about that mm -hmm. in case any of the viewers want to pick up a copy? Absolutely. Yeah. So Cat Catastrophe by the Sea is about a lost cat. Uh, so a cat named Catastrophe, a uh, Siamese cat that gets lost on the beach. Uh, and initially, Catastrophe is a little bit of a bully, uh, a little bit afraid, like a lost, like you'd expect a lost cat might be. And um, he's pretty rough on the animals that are living in the tide pools. But over time, he, he learns to, to understand that they're animals just like he is. He becomes friends with them. They help him through some of the challenges that tide pool animals face on a day-to-day -day basis. And in the end, he starts to, he has to starts to learn that respect for all living animals that, that all living animals deserve, you know, sort of our empathy and friendship. And um, it's just, it was a, the book is, is absolutely beautiful. It, it's uh, written by Brenda Peterson, an award-winning children's author and um, with art by Ed Young, who is a Caldecott winning uh, children's illustrator. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful book, but the, um, the making of the book is an interesting was an interesting object lesson in why the book was needed. Uh, we had several sort of go arounds with publishers. Uh, we had one all lined up. We thought we were going. I thought we it was uh, thought we were going through just fine, and then it was bought out by another publisher. They said, "Well, it's uh, we've got a bunch of cat books in the pipe, so we don't want another cat book." We're like, "Ugh, it's not a book about cats. <laughs> it's a book about empathy, and it's a book about tide pool animals." Like, nah. And uh, so then we were shopping it around and, and we, we had a, um, we had someone literally say that, no, we don't, we don't want to have a book that's about the, these tide pool animals, the, these animals that are ugly and underfoot. We're like, oh, you're killing me with this. And then finally we found someone who understood our vision, understood what we were trying to do. But even in that process, uh, at one point during the editing process, they came back to us and said that, you know, we're, we're fine with catastrophe having a name, but we don't. We're we're going to take the names off of the the barnacle and the sea anemone and the octopus because it doesn't feel it doesn't feel appropriate or scientific for the invertebrates to have names or for them to have names, and um, so we had a really great conversation with them and helped them understand that. Well, actually, it's super appropriate and actually kind of the point of the whole book. Uh, and just think about if you're if you're comfortable with a cat having a name, but not a, an anemone having a name sit with that yeah. for a while you know why yeah. is that and so but they were great they eventually came around and understood what we were trying to do and so we're super proud of the book super proud of the the team that we worked with to to make it happen and i think it is it's unique in that way that it's it's presenting these animals in a light that i think that is uh it, it they're not often offered and so often again they're they're if you see a book about type of animals it's often about you know just the fact that they exist and the cool things about their biology uh, and this this brings them to the front as as characters in the story. And so we're definitely very proud of the book. Great. Well, we'll have all the information about the Seattle Aquarium and the book in the description below of this Great. video. Jim, thank you so much for spending part of your day oh, with us. Pleasure. And thanks for watching Purpose Will Empathy. We'll see you next time. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free of your thinking clutter, make that important decision, and liberate you from what's holding you back? At Grand Huron International, you get to choose the coach of your choice. You get to do so anytime and from anywhere. Visit GrandHuronInternational.com and harness the power of on-demand coaching today.